Okay. So, hello everyone for this first um, talk a talk our educational platform that shares relevant content and insights on how to better control and improve our relationships with our most loved and sometimes hated device. Today, we are pleased to talk to Michael Hengstla. He, he is like a lawyer since 2014, and he's focused on data privacy protection since 2018. And he's a, a certified data protection office from the two, from the German Association for Technical Inspection. And he also offers legal solution in data protection informational technology and copyright law. That's why he's the, a good person to talk about it, um, talk about his um, questions of privacy that we have in our everyday lives. And now I invite him to join me here and participate. Hello, Misha. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for the invitation. Nice Can to meet you. Be here. Yeah, nice to see you too. Um, so let's start um, straight to the point. Like um, um, the, mon the monitoring of people has become something from our everyday life, yeah? Um, surveillance is everywhere. We are sharing our data um, in social media, in, um, with our phones, is recording many things we are doing. Um, but many people think that surveillance are not directed to them, but the bad intended people, you know? So people who owe something to the authorities or whatever. So my question would be, why, why should ordinary people who have nothing to hide worry about their data privacy? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, <clears throat> I don't know whether they have to worry or not, because uh, um, first, we have, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, like everyone has to ask ourselves, what is actually privacy? Uh, there are different definitions of privacy. Uh, if we are talking about privacy uh, in, let's say, a legal manner, then we definitely have to have uh, uh, worries about how data is processed by certain global players like Facebook and Google and others, uh, just because they do not comply with the uh, laws that uh, are in place in the moment. But uh, there are also people who say, well, uh, I like... Uh, getting personalized advertising on my phone or uh, in my apps or like on gadgets I use because uh, uh, um, I stay up to date this way and um, so I can always find stuff I really need. Like, for example, Amazon recommends books that I probably uh, will be more interested in uh, then if the algorithm is not really uh, adjusted to my interest, you know. So mm -hmm. it depends on um, how uh, the individual um, um, thinks about his own, her own privacy. But uh, if we um, take an example, uh, how, for example, Facebook uh, processes our data um, or any other big player like Amazon or um, Google, um, they put a lot of data together uh, from our um, online behavior, based on our, on our online behavior. So we go to a website which is actually not obviously interlinked with the services of Google or Facebook, or something like that. So we are actually not aware that uh, Facebook is getting the information just by visiting a website about like, I don't know, pets, for example. Mm -hmm. um, then we go to another website uh, where we do some financial transactions, for example, and Facebook still gets the data because this website also has the, for example, custom audience services of Facebook installed. So uh, once you hop from one website to another, from one application to another, um, certain services collect data about you and they put it in a profile uh, and this profile contains uh, so much information about you, about us, 
uh, mm -hmm. that we have to have to a conclusion that nowadays these big players know uh, much more things about us than we know ourselves because we can't remember our online behavior. So we can't remember every day uh, visiting uh, so what websites uh, we have visited on like for the last 10 days uh, 10 or 10 years but uh, the computers they can so and uh, let me come to the conclusion with a with an example you have probably heard about is Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica uh, was a company which uh, let's say helped uh, certain governments or certain politicians or certain companies to, um, let's say, influence the opinion of a big, of big crowds of, let's say, uh, a lot of people in the country or like the whole population of the country. Um, and they did it by getting information from Facebook as well. So you can go to Netflix and watch a very nice documentary about how uh, Cambridge Analytica screwed up and uh, how they, well, in the end they screwed up, but how they more or less uh, helped uh, to, let's say, think, Brit uh, uh, um, to force the Britons think that they have to exit the European Union just mm -hmm. by... Uh, just by uh, showing them certain information on Facebook or on different uh, websites, different platforms, which will uh, first um, somehow comply with their interests, with their mindset, with their profile. And then by showing them this information many, many, many times to build a certain opinion about Brexit. Wow, this is really crazy. So what you say is that Facebook and others, they are able to capture uh, information about you even when you're not uh, on Facebook itself, when you're like looking for another website and like just going around from website to, to website and even be on LinkedIn or other websites, you are still being uh, tracked and this information can be used to target um, advertising, right? Which can Absolutely. Be good which can be good or bad, you know? if you think of like, um, you get more what you see, but I think like you also are in kind of in a, in a bubble then, but can be used as a political target. Absolutely. Like in the case of um, Cambridge Analytica, right? Yeah. And, uh, it, and how, how does it happen actually? Why, and why is this actually allowed? Um, how do they do this? You know, maybe you can give a little, um, a bit of the technical aspect of it or how, how they do this. Yeah. Okay. The, the technical issue is pretty, um, well, it is difficult if you have to set it up yourself, but in the end, uh, it is done by uh, so-called fingerprinting. So um, you take mm -hmm. uh, a certain, well, you use JavaScript actually. Mm -hmm to uh, program the website mm -hmm. and uh, to tell the computer, which is contacting the website, that this mm -hmm. computer should send to the service of the website, not only the IP address, but all information that is on this computer, more or less, like what kind of device is it? What uh, operating system is not it? What um, screen resolution is set up? and so on and so on. And there are also uh, so-called device IDs, which are unique, that are being mm -hmm. sent to the servers. And um, depends on what services do you use. There are certain advertising IDs as well on your phone. doesn't matter whether it's Apple or Huawei or Android phone or something like that. There are advertising IDs which are also being used to identify you. And so... Uh, once uh, like a server or a company has a certain set of data about you, about your device, actually, it's not about you. You don't even have to have somebody's name or somebody's email address, but just the data about the specific settings of your device. It is enough to track a person to more or less 
uh, identify a person just by its online behavior. So every time a certain device with a certain specifications contacts a server, you can mm -hmm. say, okay, this is the device of this and this person, because sooner or later you will go to a website where you give your personal, where you will give your personal information. You you leave there your name or your address or something like that. You will probably just order something, and this will be interlinked to your device information. And um, so this uh, is the reason why you don't have to be part of the social network. Like you don't don't have to be registered there uh, for tracking purposes. Okay, wow. So um, it's quite interesting. Like, uh, so in like going to another question to the, to the next question is like government surveillance is known by majority of the people, and people know about it. People are um, scared of it. Um, people are concerned about this, but um, and and do something against it, you know. But at the same time, this private corporations like the GAFAM, the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, are, and, and many others are also collecting big amount of data and surveilling somehow um, and using uh, personal data to, to, yeah, to look into people and to sell them advertising or even to manipulate them uh, mm -hmm. in a soft way. Um, why do you think in a governmental level people care more about it and in, a, in, in if it's the private sector, people tend not to care so much? Um, well, let me um, ask you whether I, uh, I'm really getting your, uh, your question in the right way. Uh, so you, uh, your question is why like the politicians are trying to uh, create even more laws to some regulate somehow the, the privacy and stuff like that. And there's these private companies, big companies, they are still like violating uh, the rules or to answer. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. In, in one side, um, it's more about like, we, we know that uh, governments are surveilling people, right? Mm -hmm. And like, let's say we have the, um, the Edward Snowden case from 2013, the NSA was using people's phones and taking information from there. And it was a big scandal about it, right? Mm. Of course, the, the, the Cambridge Analytica was also a big scandal. But I do believe that in the, in the governmental level, if people are more aware of it to fight against it. And when it's like companies like Facebook, Google and Co, people tend not to, 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 care, to, to care about it so much, the individual, um, you know, like... Um, like um, like the people keep using it and keep like accepting everything. And do you have- okay. um... That's a very, very nice question. It's kind of philosophical, you know? So I've never thought yeah. about this. So thank you <laughs> thanks for, for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to talk and to think about it. So I think um, uh, maybe the reason for that, like to my opinion, is that uh, when we talk about governments, we talk about power. We talk about um, um, institutions that uh, are trying to somehow limit our uh, freedoms. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think, uh, still um, the, the mindset of um, the majority of people when uh, governments and political structures are considered. And that's why uh, we have a problem if, uh, like, the German government or the U.S. government uh, have certain tools to uh, um, conduct surveillance 24/7, uh, and uh, have certain tools just to get inside our gadgets, inside our lives, without us knowing. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have these private companies, which has offered free eye candy services to us, free. We don't have to pay taxes or anything. Free eye candy, very nice services, very cool and really very cool, very helpful services to us for the last decade at least. And um, they actually never told us that uh, we were the product, that uh, they were taking a lot of data from us and they were selling this data and still selling it and earning a lot of money, like billions and trillions of money with our data. Um, 
but we didn't know. And now it's somehow like coming out and um, people maybe, maybe say, okay, well, until now, nothing uh, bad happened to me. So I've been using Gmail for the last 10, uh, 10 years and I had only benefits. So nobody, I, I don't feel this surveillance or something like that. Mm -hmm. Probably this is the reason, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this makes sense. Something comes for free and when the governments are surveilling, it's only the bad, you know, there is not a the back side of it and it's something invisible as well. But in the end, it's both. Both is bad. Both mm -hmm. is of course, yeah. and it's somehow interlinked as well because the governments, in the end, if they want, they can have um, uh, they can have access to all these profiles, to all this information stored on private servers of the the gatekeepers like Google and of the GAFAM companies. Yeah. So, in the end, it's all one. Yeah. The <laughs> the, the the government will take or buy the information from the or the, the, the private sector and then use it to um, spy, manipulate people or politicians to manipulate votes and so on, right? Yeah, um, and maybe, maybe, not, um, um, maybe uh, how's it called? Um, let me add something to it. Um, we see, and then maybe this is also the reason, like if you're a private company, you on your, like, you yourself decide what to do with information and data and stuff like that. There is nobody who can actually tell you uh, to use this information, not to use this information against people. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, once the government is in place, we have a lot of examples where governments, they um, try to regulate certain things on a, a legislational level and try to force companies like GAFAM, but also telecommunications uh, like telecom or AT&T to store information for a certain period of time. It's uh, in Germany, it's called Vorratsdatenspeicherung, to store, store this communication for a certain period of time, just uh, for governmental purposes, surveying purposes, because probably they will have to get access to this information in order to conduct some investigation and stuff like that. And there is a big conflict actually on a constitutional level to get rid of these uh, regulations. And maybe this is the case because the government is also trying to force the big players to help them with this surveillance. Okay. But um, I would think then why is it bad to, um, that if the government has this information, um, why is it? Why would this be a bad thing if they would be like combating um, crimes or something? You know, why is is this um, a be better if this is this not this doesn't happen? Well, it's a difficult question. It's actually not really bad and not really good uh, because um, there are kind of um, there are different interests. On the one hand, and also there are different rights. We have the right of privacy, like individuals have the right of privacy. But we also have the right of, um, let's say, living in a peaceful uh, world free from criminal offenses, stuff like that. And we have the right to claim the government to protect us from criminal offenses as well. So, and uh, the government, of course, they had to have, uh, have to have uh, certain instruments. And uh, the, the instruments can also be surveillance. Surveillance is not forbidden per se. So it's, uh, it has to be proportionate to the other rights. And uh, this proportionality is actually the problem. Because uh, when, let's say, a police officer or a, another intelligence agency wants to conduct surveillance on a certain person, on a certain group of person. The good way would be to go first to go to court and let the judge check whether it is proportionate in this certain case to uh, conduct surveillance. Mm -hmm. This would be a good way constitutionally uh, 
um, proper way where you can weigh the the interests and the rights. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is with uh, the survey uh, surveillance, which is with the, with the modern surveillance, is that uh, there is in the moment in most of the cases no need to contact the judge. So the employees of a certain intelligence agency, they can just sit there, press a button and say, okay, let's uh, have a look on Dennis and Michael. That is a problem actually. So this is why surveillance in the modern form is actually bad. Hey, it's one of the um, um, rights that we written on the constitution, the rights to privacy, right? We, we have this right to privacy. Yeah. And there is also maybe another example like chat control. You probably everybody heard about the plans of the European Commission, European Parliament, and the European Union, let's say in whole, to intro introduce a so-called chat control mm -hmm. for the purpose of preventing child pornography. Finding, like looking, searching for child pornography on the devices and preventing it from like getting outside and preventing children from being abused. This is the official reason why they want more or less to break end-to-end -end encryption. They say, okay, you will uh, keep your end-to-end -end encryption, but before the message is encrypted and sent, we will check whether it has some illegal content on your device. So you have a EU commission or a European spy in your devices sooner or later. And this is absolutely unproportional. It can be. So this uh, specific measure of preventing child pornography, child abuse, is absolutely unproportional because it violates so many other rights of uh, humans because there is always somebody in your phone looking on everything you are saying, writing to your loved ones, to your business partners, to your friends and stuff like that. This is the wow. problem with surveillance. Yeah. Sure, super crazy. Uh, what can happen? And then once once it gets to this point, it's very hard to to go back, right? And um, how advanced is this actually? How do you think this is going to go through, or do you think this is uh, the chance that um, we're going to keep keep our rights as bigger, our right to privacy and chats? Uh, well, I hope that uh, they will drop it. But uh, if we look back to the copyright legislation, for example, of the last two or three years, uh, we were very afraid and against the so-called upload filters, where big platforms has to screen all the content uploaded for copyright violations and stuff like that. And um, Yeah, the majority of professionals and human rights activists and politicians, they said uh, it is um, it has nothing to do with copyright protection or IP protection. Uh, it is just violating the rights of people because everything will be screened. Everything you upload on YouTube and stuff like that will be screened. Wow. And still they have introduced it with some changes. They have in introduced it. So it is uh, now the law. Every big platform has to have upload filters. So they have to have the technology, uh, like an AI technology, because there are no enough, not enough people on this planet to uh, screen all this content. You have to have a technology uh, which uh, kind of automatically screens all this content. And this is also another privacy issue. Uh, mm -hmm. and the, the same could happen to chat control that there will be a lot of things against it and they will kind of find a compromise but in the in the end i have to admit that i think in the current moment it is inevitable wow it's like um 
putting little spies between our computers and everything we upload and putting everything in our phones and our computers in, in between of our messages. This is like crazy. Okay. But let's shift a bit to the, the topic. And um, since you are a lawyer and, um, you know, GDPR regulations, which is like this opt-in regulations and much more that came into place in 2017, right? We have now the fifth anniversary of it, like it was in 2017 that was implemented. Um, 18. 18. Oh, yeah, we're going gonna to have the fifth anniversary. We have the fourth anniversary. And what do you think about this... Um, these measures and were they actually effective? Um, yeah, because like, um, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, okay, uh, it's let, let's say it's very <laughs> abstract and global question because GDPR is a monster. Yeah, GDPR is a really monster. You have like uh, 63 different obligations in the GDPR. Okay, but let's let's talk then about um, on more an individual level, for example, I go to a website and, and every time I go to a website, I have to press, I accept or I deny certain, that certain information about myself is stored, recorded and sent um, to this, um, this platform. So. Okay, we can talk about cookie banners, yeah. <laughs> yeah, more in, in what we see, because like, I think like me and others, what we see from the GPR, G GDPR in this sense is like what always these banners coming around that we have yeah. to click accept or deny. Yeah. Um, what do you think about this? Is this effective? Is this changing anything? Is this good or bad? Well, um, I think that in general, like uh, as a human, I think that uh, this cookie banners uh, we now have on almost every website are just annoying. They're really, really annoying and they kind of uh, partly destroying a very nice user experience on the internet. Because every time I go on the website of The Guardian, every time, even if it's on the same day, I have to interact with the cookie banner first. And this is also kind of dark pattern, which is legally not allowed because when I once have uh, made a decision and said, okay, I don't want tracking, I don't want anything. Actually, they are not allowed to show me the, the, the cookie banner again. Mm -hmm. So they have, to, they have to somehow figure out, okay, if they are changing the technologies, if they are like throwing out Facebook and now using Google Analytics or something like that, or mm -hmm. throwing out Google Analytics and now using Matomo, then of course they can reload the banner in order to show me, okay, we have different services here and will you give us the consent or not? And once mm -hmm. they are showing it to me, every time I visit the website, it is a dark pattern, it is nudging and it will sooner or later force me to say, okay, yes, mm -hmm. I'm happy to attract me because I just want to read the news. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Let me it's, just speak a, 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 tell a little bit about dark patterns. Maybe some of, of you listening uh, do not um, know about it. As, uh, these are like little tricks that happen uh, in the internet that people find in order for you to accept something, to join a newsletter, and they, 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 they trick you. So you, without the consent, actually you end up accepting it. If you like to know more about it, there is now in our website, in our blog, there is a, a nice article showing what are these dark patterns and how to, to know about them. Yeah, thanks very much for the clarification. That's very, very nice definition of dark patterns. I couldn't do it better. And yeah, back to your question. Um, like for, for the user experience, it's very bad to have these cookie banners. And for the privacy in general, uh, it is not really helpful, I think, because I would say, I'm pretty sure that most of uh, the users, most of website visitors who have to interact with these cookie banners, they will always, uh, uh, always push accept the accept button or just click it away, something like this. Um, and only a few visitors or users will really take the time to look at the first layer and then to go to a second layer to check which services are installed on this website 
where is the information transferred to, what kind of information is it, how long is it, um, is it stored and stuff like that. Um, because actually this, all this information is required by law, but it's up to absolutely not user friendly. So this legislation is actually, actually not made for, um, yeah, for normal life. Yeah. Not for normal life. Because even for me as a lawyer who is doing, who's been doing it for the last four years, it's sorry to say it, it's every time a pain in the ass to just go through such uh, cookie banners when I'm uh, like browsing privately or to create something like this. Because every time I sit there, nobody is interested in it. Nobody. And the only positive, I think the only positive effect or impact of all these cookie banners is a bit more awareness about privacy on, or e-privacy, let's say, privacy online, digital privacy. Because people start asking themselves, oh my God, what is it about? I have never seen something like this before. Now they are telling me, they are tracking me, okay? Probably there will be people who will go and uh, Google, don't Google, by the way, and uh, start page uh, and search for what is actually tracking and what is Google ads or something like this. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then step by step becoming more aware about uh, this uh, business models we have in the moment. I think this is the positive side of GDPR and e privacy regulation. But um, uh, globally, uh, it is still not really effective uh, in protecting our privacy. Mm -hmm. It's more about awareness. Very interesting because it, although we have to put all the time there, many, many of us, yeah, saw it for the first time when we were, when we were, when this was implemented. Otherwise, we had no idea that we were being tracked like this, right? So it's a good advice to, to, to check one time at least what is happening actually, not just press accept. Um, because many times I think it's similar, right? What these websites are doing. So if you read one time, it's more or less kind of, you know what is happening there and how your information is being tracked. But how do, do you think this is going to be, for, for sure this is not going to be forever like this, right? I think they're going to find other solutions in the long term. And it's already very difficult to press no, and it's getting more and more difficult to press no. Uh, I have the feeling it's like it before it was like yes or no, but now they find ways for you to go around and you, is yes is no, no is yes, and you end up pressing the wrong once, and then it's recorded there, and you cannot change anymore, right? Or it's difficult to change. Um, um, what do you think could be improved in this, and how and how some such system could be improved? Um. Well, to, to be honest, I don't know whether there will be uh, an improvement in the, uh, in the coming years, um, because uh, as I said, we have this legislation and we have a certain um, way how supervisory authorities work and uh, they issue guidelines how a cookie banner should look like, stuff like that. And uh, this is the reason why uh, most of the businesses will try to comply more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are some uh, initiatives also on the legislation level to, um, let's say, a kind of centralize the administration of uh, personal data and device data, or let's say you can you can also say decentralized because it gives each user the possibility to decide on his own or her own um, gadget whether certain information and if yes which information is uh, given to a certain service provider. And it's called uh, something like privacy information management system. You can already read about it in the law, which is introduced in Germany. But such privacy information management system don't exist at the moment. And um, there are a lot of professionals who have looked into it. 
and they say that it is actually impossible to bring uh, something like this into life because um, all the players, all the online players, all the websites and stuff like that will have to then implement this technology, which uh, people say is not really possible because then it's like a monopoly and we don't want to have monopolies in uh, uh, our free market systems. So it will lead to a state where we will have not just one privacy information management system, but three, four, five, 10, 15, 50. So in the end, each user will have to, let's say, download 50 apps or something like that to being able to administrate his privacy, uh, his, his personal data and stuff like that. So uh, to my mind, there is, uh, uh, so there's, in the moment, there is no really hope that some, something will really improve. Mm -hmm. What will improve is, for example, that uh, the supervisory authorities will um, um, will control the websites even stronger and they will uh, try to eliminate dark patterns, for example. They will uh, force the, the uh, websites to be more compliant, more transparent, to give uh, the users equal choice of being tracked or not, and uh, to give uh, the user a possibility to get rid of this cookie banner in a very fast way and to uh, and uh, let's say and to come to the initial purpose of visiting a website which is just using the website um, this will definitely happen or it is already happening uh, there are a lot of uh, companies who are dealing with uh, let's say letters from from lawyers or from uh, governmental authorities which are saying you your website is not GDPR compliant and uh, now you have to do something. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'm like um, also keen to see what changes to better in this uh, field. Um, but let's jump to the next next topic. Um, like in individual level, how can I protect my data in like simple steps? Like, what, what can I do if I, of course, I have social media, I have, not of course, but I, I have social media and I use the internet as an ordinary person. How can I protect myself? Is there something I can do that would make it my, my privacy, um, enhance my privacy, my digital privacy, let's say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in case... We, we can go back to these different definitions of, uh, of privacy, but we can mm -hmm. uh, just take your example, like you're a person, you use uh, social media like Facebook, Instagram and stuff like that. And uh, you have a certain uh, awareness of, uh, of your data being somehow sold by these companies. And there is absolutely no way to avoid it or something. Once you are part of the system, uh, you cannot do anything. Uh, you, 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 you can close your account. You can delete your account. You can try to force Facebook to delete all the data um, or Instagram. Um, but uh, as long as you're using it, there is actually only um, um, a possibility, like it's a recommendation from me, to check whether your um, whether your privacy settings on Facebook or on Google or on Instagram are in place, whether they are uh, they are set in the right way, because uh, most of these uh, free services um, they have uh, by default uh, not really privacy friendly settings because they need uh, a lot of data from you. Uh, and then they don't want you to start with zero data. They don't want, want you to start with 100% data and then give you the possibilities to limit the access. So try to limit the access as, as far as it is possible for you. Uh, it um, also applies to all other services, like, for example, 
many people are using Google Maps. More, most of people in the world are using Google Maps, use, using Google services, YouTube and stuff like that. Go to privacy settings, go to web activity settings, uh, location settings, switch it off. Just switch it off. If you don't want to have uh, personalized advertising, uh, delete or renew your web uh, advertising IDs and stuff like that. There are a lot of tutorials on the internet how you can do it. Uh, and uh, actually, it's very intu intuitional. So if you go to the settings, you will uh, understand uh, what they mean and uh, you will understand what to switch off and what kind of things you have to switch, uh, leave, <coughs> leave on. So uh, these are the recommendations if uh, using uh, services that are for free, like Facebook, or Google, and stuff like that, uh, considered. Uh, if you have a possibility to avoid using something, then uh, try to ditch Google services as far as possible. Try to switch from Gmail to Proton Mail or to, um, let's say, Mailbox, Mailbox Org or <clears throat> Posteo. Uh, if you use a browser, try to ditch Google Chrome because Google Chrome is a spyware. Instead, you can use Brave browser, which is also a Chromium-based browser. So it looks the same. It has the same functionalities. Uh, so you will not have any, um, any problems with switching. You can also transfer. So import all your all your data from uh, Google Chrome to Brave, or use un Google Chromium or Mozilla Firefox, for example, and be sure that still every browser has also its privacy settings. So you can go to the settings and decide whether you can you you want to block some kind of cookies, you want to block some JavaScript, you want to block any other things, um, <clears throat> and um, also install a kind of ad blocker, for example, uBlock Origin. Uh, these ad blockers, they um, have a very, very vast, always regularly updated database on tracking domains because every JavaScript is coming to your um, gadget, to your device over a domain, over a URL, a certain internet address. And uh, these blockers, they block these addresses so the JavaScript cannot be leaked and cannot tell your computer to send data to certain servers. You can also use VPN to hide your IP address, virtual private networks. It means that uh, the, uh, your whole internet traffic will, will be uh, somehow linked, um, not, not linked, but will be uh, not directly guided from your computer to the server of the uh, internet, well, not the internet, but the service provider like Google, but it will first be sent to a server from uh, the VPN service provider, and then the VPN service provider will communicate with the servers you have requested. So uh, the servers won't know that which device is contacting, that I will, let's say that your device is contacting the server. So fingerprinting is not possible in that moment. And you can um, hide your IP address, but uh, be aware uh, of the fact that you are not sending your data to the service provider you're contacting, but you are sending your data to the VPN provider. So you have really to be sure that you can trust this VPN provider. So wow. it's very, it's really difficult to be 100% invisible. It's actually impossible. Yeah, so you say like, um, if you use a, if you just take a free VPN provider that you, you, you think is actually um, hiding your information, this, this service provider is getting your information. And if it's free, it might be getting your information to sell this information as well, right? Of course, but because a VPN provider is nothing uh, more than a couple of servers somewhere which are getting your request and forwarding it to the service you have actually requested. So mm -hmm. it's not a direct way, but over the VPN provider. 
So they will get all your da data, and then you have to be sure that they are not logging your data and not selling your data or something like this. Mm -hmm. we, we, you can be sh pretty sure that uh, this, for example, doesn't happen with Proton VPN because they, okay, they are saying that they are not logging anything and their service is open source. So people who are really fit in programming, they can go and check, check the source code and they will see, okay, there is no code which is somehow able to trigger logging of your information, like download and, and, <clears throat> and storing of personal information or device information, something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So open source is one um, good aspect of this software, right? Um, Absolutely. So do you think like always, always open source software would be safer than not open source software or there is also like open source not equals safer? No, no, it's, um, it's not like that, that every open source software is safer than not open source software because as I said, there has to be a person or many people who will sit down and check the source every time it is renewed because Mm -hmm. uh, in agile programming, there are releases every week or maybe twice a week, new releases. So, I mean, you have to check it every time. Uh, and you never know, probably like today there is no logging and uh, a week later they will introduce logging. And as long as nobody is checking the new source code, you won't find it, find out. Wow. Okay. These were, these were nice, um, tips and insights about actually what can happen um, to our privacy, even if we think we are going for my privacy. Um, but okay, where can I know? How, where can I research about it and know how can I trust the service or not? Like, is there things that you see like this is more trustful, this is less trustful, a part of being free or not free or? <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> you can research on the internet, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't have like a well, well, I can I can um, recommend you to if you are on Twitter, for example, which is not really privacy friendly. If you want to have something very privacy friendly, you have to go to the DeFi network, like uh, decentralized, uh, and uh, it can be, for example, Mastodon. It's a social network which is decentralized. You can follow some privacy and tech professionals who are giving a lot of uh, different insights into uh, different tools and services. Uh, for example, uh, it's a very good guy, a cybersecurity guy whom I know from my professional life. His name is Mike Kuketz. He has a blog outside and there you can find a lot of like loads of stuff about browsers, about VPN, about um, applications we use very often on our phones, for example, which has been tested by him sometimes together with other lawyers and uh, where they have found out whether uh, these applications are nice or having some privacy issues or whether they should be used to protect our privacy or whether they are useless in protecting our privacy and stuff like that. He's all, also a bit controversial about using malware scanners, for example, or VPNs. Mm -hmm. So uh, pro probably this is a very good source uh, to get some useful information on that. Okay, yeah. great. Um, we will share uh, later in the comments, we share like um, in the description, we, we share his um, link so people can also um, follow him for these issues, yeah. right? Um, so I think we are coming to an end now, like we've been talking for 49 minutes already with uh, Michelle Hengster, which is a lawyer that knows a lot about privacy, works with privacy and solution for companies and so on, has his own um, office in Dresden, right? Or, or like, uh, and also remote, now you come to Berlin sometimes, right? Well, uh, I don't, I actually don't have an office. So like my, the, the earth is my office. The <laughs> earth is your office, yeah. yeah, yeah. Most of the so work the, I do is remote. Uh, There's a the lot of remote work is also in, has clients all over, right? Uh, also in Berlin, I've seen you in Berlin sometimes. And um, 
yeah, we come to a, to a final um, question now. Like we call this, you know, the digital privacy denial, denialists, let's call them like this, who are people yeah. who say, oh, there's nothing to do. There is a path with no return. In a way, like, um, it's like um, they don't, they, they know it, but they think there's nothing to do against it, right? Mm -hmm. What would you tell these people? What, what should you speak to them? Uh, I still don't know. I have to be really honest on this question. Mm -hmm. I still don't know because it's very difficult to, um, uh, to have a, let's say, a nice conversation with uh, people who from like the first second tell I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, um, because well, like our conversation now, you're interested in this topic, so I can speak out freely. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're asking me about things, how I see them and about my uh, experience and stuff like that. So it's very easy for me to give you some examples. And, um, but uh, when you have a person which says, I don't care, which the person which is not interested to hear about uh, some like opposite insights, some things that are really happening in fact, then I think there is absolutely no sense to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, and I have to add as well that um, if we, um, try to predict what is going to happen like in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And if we read some books from historical, uh, like for historians like uh, Noel Juwal Harari, who wrote Homo Deus, short uh, future of uh, of uh, the human beings and stuff like that so then maybe people who don't care they're on the right side because they say okay in the end we won't have any privacy privacy and we won't need it anymore because people will uh, evolve and they will kind of benefit from this open information yeah but um there are also threats. People, people can in, in, private information from from us can get in bad hands and so on, and this can used can be used against us. But let's yeah, say I, the person I, is I not really against it. And what would you say, like, um, to someone? What would you say? Why, why, why this matters? Why privacy matters? Okay, That's because you don't want to sit in a toilet with a camera, toilet on with a camera on. But mm -hmm. this is like maybe a <laughs> tougher, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good uh, finalization. You don't want to sit in a toilet with the camera on, which is somehow in other ways happening, and we are not, and we are many times not aware of it, right? So that's why we should care of our privacy. So this moment, I want to really thank you, Misha, for offering your time today to to talk to us about this very relevant topic today. Yeah, and. Um, Hope you continue doing this amazing job you're doing with your agency and um, supporting companies, individuals to protect more privacy and be compliant and so on. And um, yeah, big thanks. And to feel analyze, again, we are Toka. We are a project to raise awareness about the side effects of smartphones and computer usage. And we share insights about digital detox, privacy, radiation protection. And we also manufacture like gadgets, such as Faraday bags, pouches to help individuals to protect themselves in an everyday life. So please um, check our website, www.toca.site. <laughs> and uh, if you like to talk today, please leave your comments down here in the platform you're watching and share with people who might also be interested about it. Thank you, Mishim, and have a nice um, afternoon. Thank you, Dennis. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.